Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, and I'd like to especially thank Logan for dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, uh, my submission, which I'll get into it in, in my next slide. So I did want to say, um, before we go on, as a disclaimer, uh, most of these slides were written after I got my appendix taken out last Friday. So I make absolutely no guarantees to the clarity of this presentation, but I'm here to give it anyway. So who am I? Uh, my name is Michael Alfaro. I'm a security engineer at Nefisec. Uh, I've been a pen tester and a red teamer for uh, about six years now. Um, previous to last Friday, uh, I was uh, uh, an enjoyer of the squat and deadlift, not so much anymore. Uh, and I've got various links and stuff for my Twitter. Um, and at the bottom of the page, I did want to detail that uh, there is a much more detailed paper on what I'm about to present today that has been published as part of the VX Underground Black, Mac, Black Mass release, oh yeah, um, that you can find for free online. And you can also actually now purchase as a book um, on Amazon. So, it's good stuff. So, talking a little bit about the goal of this presentation, as uh, doing red team engagements for a while now, um, I wanted to really focus on Windows internals and a lot of the things that you can do in the Windows operating system to mask your behavior and, and mask your payloads and, and techniques and things of that nature. And that inevitably led me to the Windows kernel. Part of the reason why I think that's important is because EDR and backup solutions monitor uh, you know, image load callbacks and, and things of that nature in the kernel. Part of what this talk, the reason why this talk is important to me is at Nefisec, I am the developer of a simulation ransomware offering that we have. And part of that goes against battling endpoint security solutions. So one of the technologies that I found uh, almost every single EDR on the planet uses is file system mini filters, which is an exhilarating topic, I know, so contain your excitement. Um, so part of my research was I know how to limit introspection into my tooling with other parts of the kernel. How can I extend my capabilities into the file system, more specifically file system monitoring? So the goal of this talk is going to be identifying what is a file system mini filter and what are some of the things that I can do to limit uh, EDR from, from introspecting on my activities against the file system. So the, the end goal of this is going to be patching out callbacks for file system mini filters, leveraging a known vulnerable driver. We're seeing a trend in the industry right now where threat actors are bringing their own vulnerable drivers. I've done it personally. I've blue screened a few systems doing that, much to the dismay of my clients. But um, you know, it is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. So expanding these techniques and, and really exploring what all we can do with a vulnerable driver with just a read and write uh, primitive. So what are file system mini filters? You can think of it somewhat akin to a proxy. I guess a, a better way to describe this would be, in the name itself, would be a filter. So any alterations that happen to the file system or any mounted volumes have to pass through mini filters and they get, you know, in, they get inspected, they get approved, denied, things of that nature for uh, endpoint security solutions and for anti-ransomware products. Most of the time, they're going to be you know, monitoring uh, alterations to the shadow volumes, things of that nature, um, you know, to make sure that there's nothing nefarious going on. And, and if there is something that they do detect, they can outright block that request before it goes through into the file system stack. Communication with file system mini filters. I mean, these are, these are drivers. So you know, if there's a device or a device sim link, you can communicate through it that way, but specifically with the mini filter API, there are two things that that API provides, which is a filter communication port and a mail slot, which I don't know if anybody is programming today from 1980, but I don't think anybody uses mail slots anymore. So Microsoft decided to add support for file system mini filters. Um, and this is somewhat of a recent advent. I think it's uh, since either XP or, or, or Vista, they added mini filter support. And, and there's two models. There's the mini filter model, and then there's the terrible one that nobody uses anymore. The, 
the mini filter model is uh, basically Microsoft's attempt, or, or not attempt, they're, they're very successful implementation of a way for, to, to enable developers to easily uh, write and deploy file system mini filters or, or filter drivers on the file system. The legacy way of doing it was uh, really kind of a pain. Um, God help you if you have to support one of those drivers. Everything has to be done manually. Everything has to be, uh, uh, you know, the, the file system driver has to be attached to the stack manually. And, and it, it kind of opens itself to becoming a complicated mess that could lead to system instability. So what Microsoft did is they said, well, you know, we're going to have a filter manager driver that's going to orchestrate and manage all file system mini filters and give you a simple API to use so that it can make it easier for you to prototype and develop a product uh, uh, that is a file system mini filter. So the focus of this talk in specific is going to be solely based around mini filters. Um, as I had said previously, the uh, the filter manager is the driver responsible for orchestrating basically anything that happens on the file system. When a new volume is loaded, uh, it's going to tell every single mini filter that's on the system and invoke. Uh, it's responsible for invoking callbacks. It's responsible for maintaining a list of frames and attached volumes on the file system. So I kind of wanted to, before I get into this phenomenal uh, picture, I, I wanted to go back to, uh, yes, I wanted to go back to here. So with the goal of patching out these callbacks, I need to identify three things. I need to identify the where, where do these callbacks live, I need to identify how I'm going to find them and how I'm going to patch them out. And I am going to need to identify what I'm going to be patching them with. So going back here, now I need to find the where. In order to do that, I have to look at how mini filters are registered in the first place. What is the legitimate use of a, a mini filter and what are the APIs that mini filters use regularly, right? And one of the first things that I'm going to do is, you know, read the Microsoft documentation, of course, and find that the first API that I am going to use in my demonstration mini filter, which the source code is on the right, and I know it's a little bit hard to see in the back, but bear with me here. The FLT register filter API is the first call, and what that takes is a pointer to the device object, a pointer to a registration structure, which is the most important thing for the purposes of, of this particular slide, and then a handle, uh, a, a pointer to a handle which receives a handle to the actual filter itself. So during registration, the API requires you to pass in that, that registration object, right? On the left-hand side of the screen, we see the type definition uh, from WinDebug, and, or WinBag as, as, as people call it. Uh, and on the right-hand side of the screen, we see some code responsible for setting that up. On the bottom right-hand portion of that screenshot, you can see that uh, underlined in red, I have a callbacks array, which is more or less exactly what I'm interested in. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that uh, definition is offset hex 10 from, from that structure. Um, and the structure also does contain a size member so that you can tell, you know, you can tell the operating system how large the structure is, how many um, you know, callbacks and, and things of that sort. Uh, something else that I'm going to be covering too is what is the structure of one of these callbacks. On the left hand, you see the callback structure definition. The most important thing to note is the first byte of that structure is the major function, right? What functions am I going to be supplying to the operating system that when this function is called, I want you to call the pre or post uh, uh, operation callbacks, right? Pre-operation callbacks happen, of course, before the request is sent down to the stack. Post-operation callbacks, sorry, I'm a bit tongue-tied. Post-operation callbacks happen after. And as we'll see uh, in, a, in a few slides, we'll, we'll see uh, just how that's done. Going back into uh, callbacks, just wanted to add some prototypes for a pre-operation callback and a post-operation callback. And on the bottom side, I have annotated the code that was on the right-hand side of the screen on the last side slide. Something very important to note is that if you see this during reverse engineering or if you see this during, uh, during development, all callback arrays must be terminated with an empty FLT operation registration structure 
with the major function set to IRP MJ operation, and that tells the uh, that tells the filter manager to stop parsing out the callback array, right? Which I thought was an, an interesting decision. Um, so, talking about what functions mini filters support. Well, on the file system, we have pretty standard stuff. We want to be able to be notified when somebody creates or closes a file, when somebody reads or writes it, um, you know, queries or sets attributes about the file or volumes, things of that nature. So those are the functions, and rather than paste out a bunch of constants and a, and a bunch of code, I, I kind of summarized it here. But on my GitHub repository, I do have a complete list of all of the major functions that are supported. Um, for, for callback registration. So callbacks are called, that's great. So what do we do, how does filter manager know the, um, know the status or, or the return result? And we have some standardized uh, return codes, which is a D word or a U32 uh, size um, return value, which discloses what exactly happened during our callback routine. So for example, if we want to say, hey, you know, this callback went really well, I don't need you to invoke the post operation callbacks. We can return a, a status of one, which tells the filter manager, hey, you know, call this function, but don't bother letting anybody else know. But this is just kind of, uh, you know, just wanted to highlight this and the return values for the post operation callbacks. As we're gonna see, it's gonna become very, very useful um, for, for our purposes. So we need to know what statuses we want to return, right, to patch these callbacks out and uh, basically skip over a, a target mini filter. So now that we know how filters are registered, we know what callbacks are, we know the return statuses that they need to have, right, how do we actually get this thing running? And that's with the FLT start filtering API. The FLT start filtering API is actually responsible for taking and, and initializing an instance of the filter for every single volume that's attached to the file system already um, and, and um, adding the callbacks to each, uh, to each uh, volume's callback table, which we'll also see later. But, but until this API is called, it's really just kind of hanging out, right? It's not, it's not really doing anything. It hasn't been you know, uh, set up uh, fully yet. So the call chain to identify where the callbacks live. I popped the filter manager open in IDA, and I took a look at the FLT start filtering API, and I wanted to know where does it end up, and where does it actually, you know, how does it fully set up uh, an instance of a filter, and how does it insert the callbacks into a volume, and, and most importantly, where do those live? So the call chain, which I'm not gonna cover too much, um, I started tracing functions and found a specific chain of events that led me to FLTP insert volume instance, which kind of let me know that, um, you know, uh, going into this knowing nothing about how this works under the hood, that seemed like a function that I would really want to spend a majority of my time looking into how that works. <coughs> so another step that I did during debugging is I wanted to set up a test mini filter and set a breakpoint whenever a pre-operation callback is invoked and take a look at the call trace that led me from user mode all the way into the uh, pre-operation callback into my driver. So what I did was I said, okay, listen, if anybody opens uh, a file, a specific file on my desktop, what I want to do is I want to uh, print the current process ID and then I want to have a debug breakpoint uh, so that way I can just quickly hit K and win debug, which you see on the right side of the screen. And starting from the bottom up, we'll see uh, the stack trace um, all going all the way from user mode, which is that window storage right there uh, is responsible. That, that is the notepad executable opening my file, going all the way uh, into kernel bases, create file W, into ntdll's nt create file, then transitioning into the kernel, uh, calling nt create file, and then being passed off at the top, you see it's the, the callbacks are invoked, and control flow is passed off to the filter manager, which in turn passes it, the control flow over to the uh, demo mini filter driver that I have over here. So I've spoken a lot about 
<laughs> quite a bit. And it's a very, uh, it's kind of a convoluted uh, topic to, to really address. And it's really hard to present some of this information in a way where, um, you know, I'm, I'm not covering something uh, that, I, that I haven't uh, defined. So I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about frames, talking about some of the terminology, how this all fits together. So frames describe a range of altitudes. If we, if, if we go back a couple of slides, which I'm kind of nervous to hit the back key that much, uh, we know that many filters are described with altitudes, right? Versus legacy filters, which have no altitudes. An altitude just basically describes what is the load order and what is the, the, the order of precedence when callbacks are being invoked. Something with a higher altitude is gonna be loaded first or loaded into the stack first, and the callbacks are going to be invoked first. Something with a lower altitude is gonna sit much closer to the, uh, the actual device stack. Most importantly, pre-operation callbacks are invoked from highest altitude to lowest altitude. Post-operation callbacks are invoked from lowest altitude to highest altitude. So kind of goes up from the top down, comes back up from the bottom up, right? So in this example, uh, basically what we're gonna see is we have one frame describing the altitudes of 365,000 uh, to 305,000. We have a legacy filter on the system too because of course we wanna provide interoperability so you can have both mini filters and legacy filters on the system at the same time. And then we have uh, a bottom frame that describes the lower altitudes from 165,000 to 145,000. So let's say I loaded a mini filter that was you know, 155,000, that would be stuck in between mini filter D and mini filter E on the bottom side. So a few uh, quick definitions. Um, these are the structures in the filter manager if you pop these into WinDebug or WinBag, excuse me. Um, this is what you're going to really be dealing with for a majority of, of your exploration into this. You have FLT filter, which describes a mini filter. You have an FLT instance, which is an instance of a filter. And then you have an FLT volume. Volumes receive instances of filters and filters, so it's important to call out both of them and to note that there's a distinction between the two. FLT filters, when you register a mini filter and your mini filter has a certain array of callbacks, both will be present in the filter, in the instance, and in a table in the volume. So researching this and trying to figure out which callbacks I need to patch out was kind of a pain because I started patching out the ones in the filter and they kept being invoked. And I was like, all right, well, that's not exactly great. I patched them in the instance and they kept being invoked. And I was like, okay, that's phenomenal. And then I patched them out in the instance and I was like, okay, you know, then they stopped being invoked and I was like, all right, I need to be patching out callbacks on a per volume basis, which we'll also be seeing later. So kind of going into what does a frame look like? What does this object look like? We have a, uh, we have a frame ID, we have a Unicode string, which describes the low and high altitudes that this frame describes. And then we have a list of registered filters, which is this FLT resource list head, which is basically just a fancy uh, linked list that has a count and, and a lock with it. Um, so that maintains the linked list of FLT filters. And on this next slide, we'll see attached volumes maintains a list of FLT volumes. So really what I wanna do at this point is enhance. Um, I have in the FLT volume, now I've gotten to my list of callbacks, and now I have a list of FLT instances, right? So I'm kind of really getting closer to the where, and in fact, if I inspect these in WinBag, uh, I can see that I have definitely found the where. And I found this picture of this guy uh, last night, and I absolutely had to include it in my slideshow. I thought those, <laughs> those, those binocular glasses were, were, were too good to pass up. So just a quick summary of, of where we've been at um, so far because I know that there's been a lot of terminology that's been, been thrown around and a lot of concepts that have come through really fast and, and, and quick. So in summary, frames describe a range of altitudes. Many filters fit into those altitudes. Frames contain a list of registered filters and attached volumes among many, many other things. Volumes contain a list of instances and a list of callbacks per volume. So when I'm patching out target callbacks, I need to be working on a volume, not on an instance or a filter. 
Um, so now that we've identified the what, we need to identify the how. <laughs> so I came up with a rough idea of everything that I needed to do. I need to find the frame that the target mini filter I want to patch out lives in, the altitude that it, that the altitudes that are described by that frame, right, which is pretty straightforward. I need to find uh, the actual filter itself, which maintains a list of the callbacks, right? And then I need to find the list of volumes for attached to that frame. And then for every single volume in the frame, I need to iterate through its table of all callbacks for all mini filters, compare every single entry to, uh, you know, basically doesn't match a callback that fits into my target filter, and then I go ahead and, and I patch those out too. So how do we do this, right? Uh, again, going back to the, the prevalence of bringing your own vulnerable driver to the target environment, I have to find a way, you know, some mechanism to read, you know, where, where, is, the first, uh, where is the first frame in memory, right? How am, I, how am I gonna find that? How am I gonna use a read-write primitive to find that? Well, very luckily, um, you know, uh, the filter manager provides us a way to do that, uh, and that is through the FLT globals. Very luckily, on the right side, which I'm sure absolutely nobody can see, um, <laughs> the FLT Enumerate Filters API is exported by Filter Manager, which is really good for us because we can load it, we can find the offset from the base of the Filter Manager, and then we can start pattern matching this function to find the load for FLT globals. Once we find that load, we can do some offset adjustments and things like that, and we can get a pointer to where those filter uh, globals actually live in memory, and we can start parsing that out. On the left-hand side of the screen, I've done just a little bit of uh, wind, wind bag dump of what those structures actually looks like, and we can see offset hex 58 from the beginning of those globals. We get the frame list, right? So, of course, I'm sure there are some people who have taken OSR classes who might uh, uh, not necessarily like that I'm hard coding offsets, but you know, this is the world that we live in and it's, it's 2022 and I can do whatever I want. Um, so, <laughs> we've identified the what, we've identified the, or I'm sorry, we've identified the where the callbacks live, we identified the how we're gonna find them, or at least we're gonna find the first frame to then continue on to find them. Now, we need to find the what. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> if you recall the, the giant table of uh, return statuses that I pasted in there with impunity, um, I have to find a way to tell filter manager and, and replace these callback functions with something that I know will return a value which indicates success always, right? For the case of um, Pre-operation callbacks, I need to return either a status of zero or one, but the problem is, is that I don't always know if a pre-operation callback is going to have a post-operation callback. So if I set this to pre-op success with callback and there is no post-operation callback, blue screen, right? Because it's gonna be trying to, um, you know, just call some, some random stuff. So what I wanna do is I wanna say, okay, this function returns successfully, don't bother calling the post-operation callback you know, all, all is good. And in the case where there is a post-operation callback without a pre-operation callback, I need to say that, hey, that function worked out too. So what I'm gonna do is return zero, which is really good, because the only statuses that I need to return are zero and one. So how can I, what can I use that's already existing within the kernel to return uh, these statuses? In a function, KE is empty affinity X, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with, no. Um, I have no idea what it really does anyway. But um, I found some simple gadgets that I can use to return a zero or return a one. On the right-hand side of the screen, which again, I'm, I'm sure all of like five people can see, we have an XOR EAX EAX return <coughs> gadget. On the bottom branch, we have a move EAX one return gadget. So I've identified two pieces of code that I can resolve that is from a function that is exported in NTOS kernel that I can find the address of the return zero gadget and find the uh, address of the return one gadget and replace the callbacks with uh, those gadgets to return whatever status I want. All of that being said, right, now it's time for the demo. And I have no idea what this machine is but whatever 
thing it has on the front of it looks extremely menacing. That's the only reason why I picked this picture in the first place. So I know everybody's going to have a hard time seeing this. I do have a small video if this slide would load. And I really hope I wasn't recording audio when I recorded this video. But in any case, excuse me. On the left-hand side of the screen, I'm using OSR's driver loader to load an Acronis CyberProtect file system mini filter. On the right-hand side of the screen, I have an admin command prompt up top, which I'm going to be using to execute FLTMC, which will show me all of the registered mini filters and their altitudes. On the bottom, I'm going to have a low integrity command prompt, which I'm going to be using to run my exploit. There is a vulnerable driver that is loaded on the system that allows me arbitrary kernel virtual memory read write, which I'm going to be using for this exploit as well. So get the Windows game bar out of the way. I use FLTMC to show the top filter that I want to uh, target, which is ng-scan. Um, and then on the bottom, I ran the, uh, ran the proof of concept. And scrolling back up, just wanted to show uh, kind of the process that I used to, uh, to get there. So I identified that the ng-scan filter lives in frame zero, which on most systems, you know, unless you have a legacy file, uh, legacy file system filter, you're going to have one frame, and that's frame zero. And that describes altitudes zero through 409,500. So basically, for the most part, if you're working on a modern system, you're only going to be targeting frame zero. Um, I found the instance of that filter, and I walked through all of the callbacks that that filter supports. You can see I have IRPMG create, uh, cleanup, write, set information, things of that nature. And on the bottom, if you can, wow, that's barely readable. But I've also printed out the uh, address of the pre and post operation callbacks. And if we scroll back down, or I think, I don't know if I can seek in the video, basically what I do is I patch out those callbacks um, for every volume on the file system with those return one, return zero gadgets. So now, now I can do whatever I want with impunity on, on the file system, and this file system mini filter driver for Acronis CyberProtect has absolutely no idea. I've effectively blinded this, this, uh, this particular driver. So um, as much as I'm sure everybody is, is very enthralled and excited to, to learn about that capability, um, what, what's, what's the point, right? If I can actually move. So ransomware groups are starting to bring their own vulnerable driver to um, you know, some of the targets that they're starting to hit. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm writing simulation ransomware for work and I have, you know, I, I want to make sure that my samples are as safeguarded as possible, you know, what does this mean for, for all of us? What this means is we have a swath of EDR products that are getting their image load process creation notification callbacks removed, right? But nobody's done anything about the file system yet. We've seen one attack that has been published where all callbacks on the file system have been patched. People have been monitoring you know, the, the shadow volumes and, and things of that nature. But if I remove your ability to monitor the, uh, the shadow volumes, now what are you going to do? Right? If you're not looking for executables, if, if you're not um, you know, looking for VSS admin delete shadow copies, right? and you're using a driver to introspect into altering the shadow volumes, now what are you going to do? So what's the mitigation here? Right? The mitigation here is enabling HVCI. This, this attack is flat out not possible with HVCI enabled. Enabling the Microsoft driver blacklist, which is on by default with 22H2, and most importantly, when you're triaging, if you suspect that something like this has happened, you need to go through every single volume on the file system and look for patched callbacks whose address does not lie within the module address space. For example, there's no reason that ng-scan should have a callback registered and that callback address is in NTOS kernel, right? So that being outside of that module's address space is a huge red flag. Um, so I've added a link at the bottom for just a case study of, of this happening in the wild. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge Avid Shamriz, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that second one out of risk of, of, of botching it. James Forshaw, of course, 
my friends, everybody at VX Underground. And at the bottom, there is a link for the proof of concept. I'll be publishing these slides after this talk uh, where you can check it out and kind of play with it yourself. So um, yeah.